because when it comes to the subject of uh, evolution and the origins of man, you may know this, there is a growing population of people. And these people are deadly serious. They believe that we are going to learn the secrets of our origin this year. 2012 with the return of the ancient creator gods. Where is my picture that's supposed to be up here on the screen? <laughs> Thank you. I pick on Sam the cameraman. Uh, we go all over the place together and he is like one of the coolest guys on earth as long as he does everything exactly the way I want it to be done when I want it to be done. Um, uh, the, the mayor, in fact, this, this issue is so big right now that the mayor of Bougarroch, France, in southwestern France, believes that as many as 100,000 sojourners in the next few weeks are going to make their way to his little villa so that they can go to this right here, this granite mountain. This thing isn't working at all. This granite mountain, the Pic de Bougarroch uh, in uh, southwest France. It's that uh, odd, you might have read about it on the internet, kind of upside down mountain. And uh, these UFO contactee devotees believe that uh, it is inhabited by ancient aliens. And these aliens at the rollover of the Mayan calendar this year are going to emerge from that granite mountain to meet them there. And they're going to be the first ones that are going to be saved. Now, I learned about this uh, when uh, Mick Brown, who was the writer for this 10-page uh, uh, feature article, Apocalypse Soon, which which was published in the January 2012 Esquire magazine. Mick had uh, traveled to Bougarak, and as he was, I found this out later, I didn't know it at the time, as he was trekking up the side of the peak of the Bougarak, he became tired, and he sat down, and he wrote later in this article that when you're traveling, you should take a good book to read. So he sat down, and out of his uh, uh, hiking bag, he pulled a copy of a book by a strange Westerner by the name of Thomas Horn, called Apollyon Rising 2012. <laughs> Mick wanted to know all about 2012, and he, he got to know a little something about Jesus Christ, so I was really happy with that. But he sat down and he started reading. He became very intrigued with the whole Christian evangelical take on the occultism around the year 2012. Uh, he went up the mountain and he met with the UFO contactees and shared the gospel according to Tom Horn uh, to the alien wannabes. <coughs> You never know where you're going to preach, right? <laughs> Have you ever done that in your life? You do something, you write a letter, you give somebody a book, you never know where it's going to go. It's funny how this stuff can come around and you find out that you were a witness to people you couldn't have never even imagined that you were going to be a witness to. In any case, he goes up, he talks to the alien people, he comes down off the mountain from the alien people. And he goes back to England uh, where he sends me an email. He says, I am just really interested in what you have to say. You have a very unique, ta unique take uh, as a Christian on all this subject matter. Would you talk to me on the phone? I said I would. We spent about three hours on the phone. And then actually 80% of the 10-page feature in Esquire magazine in 2012 on 2012 was a conversation that I had with him. My pointer for some reason won't point at this magic screen. But on page 169, is my favorite part of this article and I want to use this to launch the conversation that I want to have with you tonight. Uh, it says, Thomas Horn takes a carefully measured view on what might actually happen in the year 2012. Speaking personally, he says he has no particular plans for 21 December 2012. And he asked me on the phone, he says, uh, so what kind of exact plans are you making for the end of the Mayan calendar? And this is what I said. Uh, oh, during the day, I'll probably be visiting my family. And on that night, I'll be going to sleep. If the, <laughs> if the end comes, I'm as ready as I can be. If it doesn't, tomorrow is another day. And uh, he uh, ends that by saying, walking back down the mountain in Bugarek, that seemed as sensible as approach as any. I think that... <laughs> A lot of people think I talk about crazy stuff, but I think after he came down from the island of woo-woo up there, <laughs> I was about as stoic as it gets, right? Uh, so, uh, but 
I put, a, I put a note down at the bottom of this, how can I have a tranquil attitude about the year 2012? Now this is a very serious question because there could be in a crowd this size, there could be people who are, they're not believers. I mean, they just came here, who knows how they wound up here, that happens. And they will look at people like me and they will look at so many of you that I've met here today who also are tranquil. You have a peace that passeth understanding. I mean, how in the world world can you be so surrounded, right, by so much stuff? I mean, Obama alone is enough to give you nightmares. <laughs> and we're talking literally about a world that feels like it is falling completely apart. There's all kinds of crazy stuff. Much of it does feel very much like it is a reflection of end times biblical prophecy, earthquakes in diverse places, the sea and the waves roaring. And then this crazy weird stuff, there shall be signs in the heavens. Uh, Gary Sturman in last month's magazine wrote an article about the sounds of trumpets that people are hearing that seem to be breaking through. And there are other places where people are reporting what sounds like the clanking of metal, and it's really loud, right? This is happening all over the world. It's not just nut jobs that are hearing this stuff. These are, some of these people are, I mean, they're, they're police chiefs, they're academics, they're teachers. And the first time I heard that, the clanking of metal, I said to Gary, I said, Gary, does this sound uh, to you almost like angelic warfare could be breaking through from one dimension to another dimension because we know in the end times that there will be angelic warfare. And the poor devil, uh, how could you be so deceived, really? I mean, you've already been beat. You're going to be beat again. You already know it. What? I guess you just say, well, I'm going to go down in flames. Yeah. As a matter of fact... <laughs> But we're surrounded by all this stuff. We should just be unnerved, right? How in the world can we stand here looking at all of the phenomenon that is going on in the world around us and say, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. How, where does that come from, right? All right, well, I want to talk about that, and I can tell I'm going to have to go very quickly. So we're going to, oh, I was commissioned with the task to talk to you tonight about 2012, is it the end? After 130 years, I decided I'm going to put George Hawkins Pember's classic masterpiece, Earth's Earliest Ages, back in print. It'll be in print in a couple of weeks from now. Uh, and you've got to be brave to read it because he made no bones about it that the final sign heralding the coming of Jesus Christ would be the return on earth of the offspring of the watchers, the Nephilim. Uh, but... I said earlier, I would tell you this, did early Christian leaders also agree that the end would begin in the year 2012? Uh, Chris Putnam, I don't know, is he in the building? When we were doing uh, research for the book Petrus Romanus, The Final Pope is Here, I learned that this guy is really a bloodhound. He got to digging around in coldy old moldy corridors of some of our greatest universities, Yale University and others, and he found that over 160 years ago, the leader of the first great awakening in America, Jonathan Edwards, can you believe that? Old sinners in the hands of an angry God, Jonathan Edwards tied the arrival of the Antichrist in the Great Tribulation period to the year 2012 and 2016. And uh, Chris is going to be talking about this subject matter again on Sunday. And I think they have a Q&A session so you can put him on the spot and say, prove it, pal. <laughs> 130 years after that, in 1878, William uh, J. Reed did the same thing, writing in his lectures on the Revelation concerning the papal system. We are prepared to answer the question, when will the papal system come to an end? It will be destroyed in the year 2012. The list goes on and on. Examples of the year 2012 and 2016 saw uh, time and time again by Christian writers. The Christian Spectator, the Monthly in 1885, Critical Commentary and Paraphrase of the Old and New Testaments by Lowith and Lohman, 1822, the American Biblical Repository in 1840. Notes on the Revelation of St. John by Loman in 1773. Theological Dictionary of Princeton University in 1830 tied this time frame to the year 2012. Um, the Agreement of Ecclesiastical History in 1776. The Works of Reverend P. Doodridge, D.D. Uh, the, in uh, 1804. The International Sunday School Lessons Publication in 1878. Character and Prospects of the Church of Rome in Two Discourses by the Reverend William Macri in 1829. The Panop 
Theopolis and Missionary Magazine in 1809. Lectures on Romanism, Joseph F. Berg in 1840. The Congregational Magazine for the Year in 1834. The Presbyterian Magazine in 1858. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, for hundreds of years, both pagans and Christian leaders looked toward the year 2012 as, as an event horizon, a moment when Nephilim return and the end does begin. And that brings me back to my original question. How in the world, uh, if these people are right, why shouldn't that scare us? Uh, but it has to do with having a proper concept of God that is based upon the full revelation of God from Genesis to Revelation. Um, this year, I was a pastor for 25 years, and I got to tell you, this last week when I read that uh, one of our old line churches are now doing whatever ecclesiastical work they need to do in order to start ordaining transsexuals to the ministry. And uh, the next day, I think it was from the Lutheran organization talking about how they're going to bless homosexual marriages. And at the same time, however, that these people are becoming so liberal, they also uh, now no longer even believe in the divinity of Christ. They doubt that he was anything more than a historical figure who happened to just be in the right place at the right time and a cult following uh, grew up around him. But I want to tell you something. That's not the kind of faith that's going to get you through if this kind of stuff really starts happening. Uh, the rapture could happen, the Lord could take us all away, but we could see some stuff coming down on this earth, and I want to have great faith, don't you? And I want to tell you something, they're wrong about Jesus, because from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, it gives us the concept, I'm going to give it to you very quickly and then I'm going to quit. In Genesis, he is the prophesied one, who will be the fulfillment of the proto-evangelium, the divine seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head and redeem mankind to God. That's where the revelation begins. Oh, you know he's our champion, don't you? Uh, you know uh, partly why I can have such great confidence, because I don't intend on slugging it out with the giants all by my little pretty self. <laughs> In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest making intercession for men in the Holy of Holies. In Numbers, he is the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that guides the covenant people. In Deuteronomy, he is a prophet like unto Moses that will arrive in the fullness of time. In Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, he is the captain of our salvation, the judge and the lawgiver and the blessed kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he is the coming Messiah, exalted by power with God, uh, with, by God with power. In 1st and 2nd Kings, he is the king who will reign with ultimate power. In 1st and 2nd Chronicles, he is from the tribe of Judah, typified by the temple with wisdom greater than that of Solomon. In Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, <coughs> excuse me, he is the day spring from on high and the Lord our shepherd whose kingdom shall be from everlasting to everlasting. In the Song of Solomon, he is the bridegroom whose marriage to the bride is faithful and forthcoming. In Isaiah, he is God with us. The sevenfold spirit of God is upon him. He heals the blind, makes the lame walk, unplugs the ears of the deaf. He becomes a light to the Gentiles who dies as a guilt offering for sin, but who rises from the dead to live forever. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, he becomes the righteous branch. In Ezekiel and Daniel, he is the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. In Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. <laughs> He is the pierced son and the burden bearer, a mighty savior and a cleansing fountain who becomes a priest and a king. And then, ladies and gentlemen, the New Testament arrives, and here he is, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, the fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah, born of a virgin. In Mark, he's a miracle worker. In Luke, he's the perfect physician. In John, he is the only begotten son of God, the lamb of God, the bread of life, the light of the world, and the door to the sheepfold. In Acts, he is the ascended Lord and the judge of the living and the dead. In Romans, he is the root of Jesse that becomes a rock cut out without hands, that becomes an offense to many, but that becomes a deliverer to others. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he is the first fruits of the church. In Galatians, he sets us free. In Ephesians, he is the head over all things and the cornerstone of the church. In Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, and Timothy, he is the image of the invisible God who meets our every need, the mediator between God and man, and the soon come 
coming king. In Titus and Philemon, he is the blessed hope and a friend who is closer than the brother. Somebody say amen. Amen. In Hebrews and James, he is the author and the finisher of our faith, the key to patience and wisdom, and the blood that washes away our sins. In First and Second Peter, he is a living stone and the chief shepherd who watches over the church. In First and Second John and Third John, he is everlasting love and eternal life for those that know him. While in Jude, he is the only wise God and our one and only Savior. And now let hell hear this, because in Revelation, he arrives, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the manifested word of Almighty God, the bright and morning star, the lion of the tribe of Judah that hath prevailed, the king of kings and lord of lords, who, ladies and gentlemen, whose appearance is going to shatter the schemes of occultic spirits and evil men with the brightness of a thousand suns, and at whose coming every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How... How can I have confidence for the future? How can I not have confidence for the future? The bottom line, the occult have a plan. God has a better one. I hope you know whose side you are on. And there's uh, the last and final part. Thank you uh, for putting up with me. It's that uh, odd, you might have read about it on the internet, kind of upside down mountain. And uh, these UFO contactee devotees believe that uh, it is inhabited by ancient aliens. And these aliens at the rollover of the Mayan calendar this year are going to emerge. (laughs) Thank you. I pick on Sam the cameraman, Uh, we go all over the place together and he is like one of the coolest guys on earth as long as he does everything exactly the way I want it to be done when I want it to be done. Um, uh, The the mayor, in fact this this issue is so big right now that the mayor of Bougarac, France, in southwestern France believes that as many as 100,000 sojourners in the next few weeks are going to make their way to his little villa so that they can go to this right here, this granite mountain, this thing isn't working at all, this granite mountain, the Pic de Bougarac uh, in uh, southwest France, deadly serious. They believe that we are going to learn the secrets of our origin this year, 2012, with the return of the ancient creator gods. Where is my picture that's supposed to be up here on the screen? (laughs) Because when it comes to the subject, of uh, evolution and the origins of man, you may know this, there is a growing population of people. And these people are de- 